So we are back to the chosen journey with Big Money Grip, Steve Carse. And Steve, uh, before we jump into today's topic, uh, this weekend, it is my doggie's birthday. We talked about our mutual admiration of dogs, specifically Shih Tzus. Turns out we both have had or had Shih Tzus. My dog, Ollie, is turning nine years old this weekend. Very good. I mean, they're, they're amazing pets. They're very loyal. And, uh, you know, as we've talked about, I had two of them. One lived till 13 and one lived till 17. Uh, and, you know, obviously it becomes a challenge as they get older, but, uh, you know, they're just, uh, they're just friendly reminders of how good life can be and, uh, how loyal they can be to you. Uh, just like children, right? You take care of them and, uh, you know, they're going to love you no matter what. I think that it's very different because they actually appreciate it <laughs> and they remember it. It's so funny compared to children, right? They ask for so little, you know, and they just give so much back and it's amazing. And uh, it was, cause we talk about the journey, you know, and as we get to know each other, it's our paths, as far as growing up as kids without fathers, both of us having shits. It's amazing how you start to pick up these things and realizing you come from so, such different backgrounds, yet you can have so much similarities. So we're learning about our journeys, respectively, as individuals, as a team here, and for other people to find, you know, their journeys. Yeah, absolutely. You know, like, you just never know, right? I mean, until you really get down to the nuts and bolts of it, you start just talking to people and, you know, seeing their background, where they're from, where they've traveled along the paths to get to where they are today. Uh, you know, you get attracted to many people who are very similar to what you grew up with or uh, just how the world works is, you know, it, it, they say opposites attract, but there's definitely something to be said uh, about people who have traveled the same path and, and understand each other from, <clears throat> excuse me, from that point of view. I will, I will tell you as a little teaser, I did try to reach out to Carlos Delgado. I did find his contact info. Mentioned him what we're doing here, invited him to the program if he'd like to come join with his experiences. Have not heard back yet, but it's amazing. You know, we, we dropped out Howard Battle, the other chapter, and Carlos and your different experiences. And it'd be, it'd be great to, you know, people that have played with you, have experienced with you as well, you know, they're welcome to come join us. And, you know, hearing your camaraderie and their journey, your journey, and how you guys cross paths, you know, there's so many stories to be told on these journeys. Well, in baseball, right? you come from all backgrounds, you know, you play with all different types of players across the country. It's not like you grow up in New York and you play with all New Yorkers or you grow up in Mississippi and you play with all, you know, kids from Mississippi. It's like, all right, you get drafted, you go up to a team. Now you have to learn, you know, from all over where they're coming from, you know, what they like, what they don't like, you know, and then you develop those friendships. I have many friends, that, you know, are Venezuelan or Puerto Rican or Dominican, you know, it's just, uh, it's just life. It's just who you are as people and, uh, and how you connect as people. And, you know, it's just, it's a lot of fun to know people's backgrounds and to get to understand how they grew up and maybe some of the hardships that they've had to get to this point. And then, you know, you, you share those uh, about yourself and, and you see how equal and you see how uh, you know, common things are in the world and you're not just separated from everybody else. Are you a big, uh, major league, uh, the movie fan, the, the, uh, Charlie Sheen movies? Nah, I watch it if it's on, but I won't go out of my way to find it. You, you remember the first one where they're going to put together the worst team possible and they bring all these players from all different walks of life. And Charlie Sheen pulls up on his motorcycle. And where did you play? California Penal League, you know? <laughs> but, That's right, uh, yeah. But is it, you know, it's a parody, obviously, but they, when you come to spring training, like people are coming from everywhere, not just different leagues, but different countries. It's incredible, right? How they amass this talent. They're looking, scouring the earth, and then you all come together and you got to play as a team. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. And, and it's not as you come as a team already, right? You come to spring training as an organization and then the organization filters you out and puts you in different levels. And then whatever level you make, then you have to, then you have that team and then you got to figure out who's on that team and then how to become teammates, you know, how to become friends, how to, how to, 
you know, coincide with one another and, and have each other's back, you know, um, you know, I, I'd like to use the analogy of like a band of brothers, like you are with these people for such a long time, longer than sometimes your family uh, in general, being from February through September. And you really get to know each other really well. And not that you're not going to have squabbles like you would in a family if you were brothers or a brother and a sister and, you know, have disagreements. Uh, but at the end of the day, you're all in it for the same purpose. You're in it for the same goal. And, uh, you know, when you can have other people, you know, pushing you and pulling you towards that finish line, uh, you know, it helps helps out through the tough times. I can tell you that. Well, it comes up inevitably the, the whole Toronto Blue Jay talk. We got the rookie card sitting up there. So you're part of the organization, you know, me being based in Toronto, Ontario, you being in Arizona, but the Jays connection comes up us also the, the team they've amassed, you know, and I remember you talking about in a previous chapter, how the advantages of coming up level to level as a group, when you have that core of the team and how you got to experience it. Now the Jays as well done that with a few of their key hitters, but uh, it's got to make life a lot easier when you're, when you know, you're going to make the team out of spring training, but you've had guys that came up every level with you or a few guys, right? Well, yeah. I mean, I, I think that's just uh, how certain organizations do it. They want to keep <clears throat> their core guys together because if they feel like they've scouted and done their homework and, and put the right guys together, that this group will be in the big leagues together. So if you can play at level to level, and then most of those guys can get to the big leagues, because not everybody's going to get to the big leagues. Uh, but if you can have three, four, five of those guys get to the big leagues, wow. Uh, what kind of camaraderie does that make for guys who know each other already, know what you're going to do, know each other as people, uh, have developed those friendships and those connections. And now you get to play together and, and try to win at the highest level possible. So, uh, you know, it's an organizational philosophy. Uh, some do it, some move guys quicker than others, but you want to build that team chemistry because I think when you have team chemistry, uh, it just uh, promotes winning. Agreed. Agreed. And, you know, this is a good segue to today's chapter because it's one thing as far as the organizational philosophy, it's your teammates and, 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 and banding together. It's also one's own role. And I'm very curious in today's chapter to go into your role as far as starter reliever. And what I'm going to focus on is that transition in Cleveland when you hit over there. Up until the time that you came to Cleveland back in 98, 99, from the time you were in the minors to the time you first were in the majors, did you always see yourself as a starter? Was there ever a thought of relieving, closing? Walk us through that. Yeah, no, always considered myself as a starter. High school, I started, came out. Minor leagues, I started. Uh, obviously, you know, the injury took place in, in, in 94. I had Tommy John in 95. Uh, worked my way back from that long road. A lot of perseverance in that. Uh, got back to the big leagues as a starter in 97. And then... Uh, you know, after 97 with Oakland, got traded over to Cleveland and I went to spring training as a starter. Um, but at that point in time, uh, I, I didn't make the team. I got sent down and John Hart was the general manager at the time. And, uh, you know, he told me that I was going to go down to AAA. I was going to build some more arm strength. I was going to be starting that, that down there. But uh, there was a possibility that I might come to the big leagues and, and be a reliever. And it kind of blew my mind. I was like a reliever. I'm not a reliever. Like, that's not what I want to do, you know? And, you know, sometimes you don't get to choose what you want to do. You know, sometimes the organization has plans for you and, you know, until you're established and doing a certain job in the big leagues, that's kind of where you filter into and what you do. At the end of the day, it was the big, biggest blessing that have, uh, has ever happened to me. Uh, you know, I, I started in AAA that year, uh, made, I don't even know how many, 10, 12, 15 starts, got called up to the big leagues and got put in the pen. And I had no idea what I was doing at this time. I had a good arm. I was up there. I was the long man. Um, and, you know, I just had to, I had to learn on the fly, what to do, 
and how to do it and ask questions to the relievers in the bullpen, like Mike Jackson, Paul Shuey, and Paul Ossenmacher, uh, you know, guys like that, that I was like, Hey, I, I don't know the first thing about relieving. Like, what do we do? Like, they're like, well, when the phone rings and they call your name, you get up and you warm up. <laughs> it's like, okay. And like warm up fast. So, uh, it was just one of those things where uh, I was learning on the fly and I had to understand like, this might be my job. And then as I relieved in 98 and went into 99 spring training, uh, I started performing at a high level and I started throwing harder after going to winter ball in 98, I came back to spring training in 99 and I was throwing from 93, 94. And then all of a sudden in 1999, uh, for some reason, I started throwing 98, 99 miles an hour, and things just transpired from there. 98. So I let's 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 keep on 98 for a moment. Do you recall how many starts you made that year? In 98. Yes. In the big leagues or in the minor leagues? Big leagues. In the big leagues. You're one. Calling... Correct. Baseball <laughs> Reference has you down for one start. In 1998, do you recall it's what it's when you first came up, or was it during the middle of the year? Do you recall that started that one start for the year at all? It was definitely not when I came up. I don't remember when it was, but it was probably one of those times where it was an emergency start, and I had to fill in for somebody. And since I was the long man at that particular time, um, I was already stretched out pitch wise, so they probably just told me that I was going to start that game. I remember watching once a uh, Cubs game and uh, I believe it was, I believe it was the Cubs, not Milwaukee. So I'm pretty sure it was the Cubs. And I remember, uh, you know, watching like this afternoon baseball game and starter gets injured after two pitches and they're like, Chris Bosio, you're coming in. And like, I think he had a hot dog or something in the bullpen and he's looking and he's like, Oh boy, he ended up pitching like six, seven innings. I remember. And he was Ooh. solid and that revitalized his career. It's amazing how that can go, but uh, it's crazy. This is not the era of openers where a guy's settled into one or two uh, pitches. Uh, sorry, one or two innings. This is like probably they just threw you in there. I wasn't sure if it was when I'm looking at when you see the numbers, you don't know the stories behind the numbers. In my head, I'm building up a story. Maybe you came in for the one start and they're like, OK, no, you're going to be relieving this year. Didn't go down like that at all. It was just like. No, it didn't go there. like that at all. Yeah, it was just a, a random start. Okay, so then we jump into 99. 99, you come with more clarity, throwing harder after winter ball. Where did you play winter ball that previous year? Played winter ball in Santurce, Puerto Rico. How was it there? A lot of fun. Lived on the beach. Uh, winter ball's very laid back. You go there, you get your work in, you pitch, you go down to winter ball to win because that's their season. You go down there to work on things. And I went down there to work on my split finger fastball. And uh, had a really good uh, good time down there. Uh, pitched well, and I was able to prepare myself for big league camp in 1999. Who sets that up uh, when you go to winter ball at that point? Is it yourself or the team? No, it's the it's it's a combination of 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 people. It's your agent uh, who negotiates the deal for you. They talk to the team. The team make sure that the team wants you to go to winter ball to work on certain things, and you know, not overuse you so to speak, you know, your obligations to the major league team. But uh, if you miss time or you need to work on something, teams are more apt to let you go and, and throw a certain amount of innings with some, maybe some restrictions on there. Sleeping bag on the uh, beach or did they actually provide accommodations on the beach? No, 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 no. You got to find your own accommodations. You find your own apartment, you find a place to live. And then, uh, you know, you get a rental car and then you be able to drive to the field and, and do what you need to do. Uh, winter ball, 98 to 99, Puerto Rico at that point. I imagine it's not big money uh, finding accommodations as a... Uh... Uh, no, it was great. I mean, yeah. like, uh, it was very easy. You know, obviously friends down there, uh, friends I've played with, uh, word of mouth uh, of where to stay and, and things like that. So it's a pretty easy process to, uh, to, to undertake. And, and you go down there for, you know, two months. And uh, re relieving mostly or completely over there at that point? No, I went, I went down there starting. Oh, you did start? Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, I was a long man finishing the 99, 98 season, and then I went down there as a starter uh, mm -hmm. because, you know, it's, it's a lot easier to work on your split finger fastball when you can start the game and throw 75, 80 pitches as opposed to coming in and maybe only throwing 10 pitches in one inning.
Interesting. So you're still throwing several innings each time. So you were uh, on a starter schedule. That's yep. a, understood. So now you're coming into spring training in 99. And at what point do you have the conversation of roles at this point? Uh, no conversation. I just go into spring training, uh, knowing that I'm in the bullpen at this particular time. Okay. And, you know, when I get called, I'm going to come up and, and I'm going to go and do my, my inning of spring training work. And, uh, as spring training developed and transpired from mid February through mid March, uh, you know, I, I started to find some velocity. Uh, I've always been a strike thrower. Uh, you know, my curveball was on point and then my, my split finger started to come around and it gave me that third pitch. And that's, essentially what transformed me as a major league pitcher is going from a two pitch pitcher fastball curveball to a three pitch pitcher, which is fastball curveball split and uh, just completely changed who I was uh, as a, as a big league player. Same because you hear it a lot of closers, you know, uh, with limited uh, usage that they're one, two pitches, right? I, I think in this day and age to have a th three pitch pitcher as a reliever, I, I think is quite a bonus. It is. And, and most guys, you don't need three pitches, but to have them uh, is is unique and it just gives you, you know, that much more of an advantage. I mean, if you come into a game and a guy knows you throw 50, uh, knows you throw two pitches, it's 50 50. Right. What happens? You come into the game and you don't have your curveball and you can't throw your curveball for strikes. Now you kind of get boxed into one pitch and you better be really good with your fastball. Or these guys are that good that they're going to hit mistakes and and uh especially if they're sitting on one pitch unless you're mariano rivera i don't know many guys that are able to rely on one pitch and still fool people yeah 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 it's 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 a really tough craft uh and you need more so walking through 99 how many starts did steve carsey make in 1999 i want to say i made four starts close three 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 did it make sense? yeah Okay. Yep. How did that work out? Was it the same type of scenario as far as spot starts as a, as a long man, or how did you get the three that year? Uh, yeah, it didn't work out as well as I wanted it to, <laughs> to no. be quite honest with you. Uh, no, it was probably uh, the worst decision that I've ever made, uh, mm. trying to tuck myself into the, to the rotation since I was a reliever for the majority of the year. Um, we had a couple of injuries in the starting rotation coming down the stretch. Uh, you know, I was in the bullpen. I was throwing great. And I went to the manager at the time, my, my car grove. And I was like, Hey, I can start. Like if you need somebody to start, uh, I can, I can do this. You know, they, they talked about it as an organization and they did it. They knew I had starter in my blood from when they traded for me. And, and I have done that. So they knew I could handle it. Uh, but, the the uh, the transformation of moving from the bullpen to the starting rotation and taking on that type of workload really hurt me. And uh, after my third start, I remember this. I was in Oakland. They spotted me like four or five runs, and I was up four or five nothing. I went out there, and uh, my elbow started barking because the workload was too much. And then uh, I had to go on the uh, – DL or the IL, what they call it now, came back at the end of the year and uh, wasn't the same guy as I was before the injury. Um, we made the playoffs in 99. I was used sparingly because I was, my elbow was banged up and then ended up having surgery at the end of 1999 after the season ended uh, to take bone chips and spurs out of my elbow. So, uh, like I said, the thought was there to help the team, but individually the workload probably wasn't the best thing to do going from relieving and throwing at that point, I was a one or two inning pitcher throwing mostly 25 pitches and in it, 25 pitches and outing 30 pitches and outing, and then trying to get up to 70, 75 pitches. Uh, it's just a lot of stress and a lot of strain for a guy who throws hard. And uh, uh, if I could go back and, and change that decision, I probably would. After that point, before those three starts, typically what innings were you pitching in? Those one, two, seventh and eighth inning. So you were the hold guy. 
sixth, seventh, eighth inning. I was, yeah, anywhere when, you know, uh, you know, guys on base and trying to get out of a jam. That's how well I was throwing the ball at that particular time. And uh, I was, I was highly trusted to come in those situations and do it. Um, you know, and that year, I believe uh, I ended up winning 10 games and a really short amount of time because I would come in when the game was close. We were either down one, tied or up one. Uh, and then I would hold them. And then my team scored uh, at will, basically, in 1999 because the Cleveland Indians offense was uh, a tremendous offense in 1999 with the players that we had. So, uh, again, you know, uh, it was the it was the correct thought of trying to help the team. Uh, but personally, it didn't work out as well for me as I would have wanted it to. The good, the good news in that, in, the, in certain senses, I think you just deleted the inevitable because where you ended up progressing to, you found your niche and you found your role. If you hadn't gone and done that, uh, I think you still would have progressed to where you were going to go. You're ultimately going to be a closer. It was just it, perhaps it set back. But in, in that sense, you know, you're lucky when you have nine lives or five lives or whatever amount you have in baseball. Because, you know, if you think about every adversity you ever faced, a lot of guys have been in your position, but they don't come back, you know? Think to where you came when you're telling me the story and I'm thinking in my mind, you, the way it started your progression, 98 into 99, but the adversity you faced in Oakland, not everybody comes back like that. Some people are done at that point. And then you, 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 uh, you got the role as a reliever, good groove, go do some spot starts that could have been over at that point. You know, at any point, ba baseball could be a very unforgiving game. One switch, one injury, that could be it. It's, you know, I, I believe you were very fortunate in that sense to keep going but you also, you know, you have surgeries, you got to rehab it. People, you know, it doesn't happen overnight, right? It doesn't happen overnight. I was never going to quit. I mean, that's just not who I am as a person. Um, mm -hmm. I was always going to, you know, uh, have the perseverance to uh, continue to work, continue to play the game that I loved as long as I could rehab my arm and, and get back to uh, being as competitive as I wanted to be on the mound and competing to the highest level possible for me. Um, and then, you know, after that, uh, after the surgery, it felt great. And it was one of those things where, you know, that, that took care of it. And, and I was fully healthy again, going into the 2020, 20, uh, 2000 season. Incredible. And, uh, you know, I, I'm sure like you being human, when you're going, when you're going through those and you're like, not again, and I, you know, there's gotta be those days still where like, ah, you know, do I really want to do this? Like, you know, it's, but it, I assume it's like 1% thoughts versus 99%. I'm doing this. There's no quit. Oh, there's definitely no quit. Uh, if I, again, if I could go back and be there and make that decision again, it's, it's, it's one, it's one that I regret to this day going into the rotation. Uh, and, and it was nobody's fault except my own because I asked for it. Uh, I wanted to do it. And, um, you know, I, I wasn't maybe, thinking long-term at that point. I was trying to help the team at that particular time because we had some guys on the, uh, uh, on the injured list, uh, some starters. So I wanted to fill in until they got back. But I really think it hurt, uh, hurt us going into the playoffs in 1999. I think I could have been a difference maker in, in that series uh, against Boston in 99 uh, to help us you know, move on and have an opportunity to, to win a World Series that year. So I was really disappointed that uh, I wasn't able to contribute uh, as, as much as I could during the, the stretch run or in the playoffs in 1999. Part of the show's journey, you know, it's not always roses and sunshine people. Like one of the things is it's difficult things, you know, this is real life, you know, as far as growing up without a father, going and having Tommy John surgery, you know, incidents do happen. And it's, it's those things that they do stick out. And I know myself, when I look at it, Steve, I look at it as a fan, I look at it as somebody that's always been interested in your career. And, and if we're going to talk about Steve Carsey's journey, his career, we're going to, you're going to have highs. We're going to have lows, right? Like it was not, not always so easy. Uh, no, nothing's ever easy in life. Is it? Uh, I mean, it's just uh, one of those things where, again, you, you, you try to pick the right path that's best for you. And that's going to get you to where you're going to be happy. And uh, you know, where where you feel like is the best spot for you um you know some of those decisions work out well some of those decisions don't work out as well as as you would hope but uh as long as you can learn from them 
And that's what I try to teach, whether it's my son or the boys that I coach, that like, listen, uh, at the end of the day, we all want to do well. We all want to succeed. But there are going to be times that we don't and we need to learn from these uh, setbacks or these failures because that's how we get better. Poetic Justice says that third start that you brought up, that last one where the elbow's barking, which city were you in again? I was in Oakland. Of course you have to be in Oakland. It's, uh, see, the, the universe speaks in its way, right? And of course, it has to be Oakland where, you know, where you actually made your debut. You just left there. You are now transitioning, but you see they all kind of interconnect there. And, you know, I think about Eckersley. And we talked about him, right? And everybody knows him as a closer. But if you look back in the, into the memory banks and for the, the, us old timers, you know, he wasn't in my generation, but I certainly watched the video of it and I looked up his stats. He was a starter. And I look at those a very two good one. amazing one. Like he, people don't realize that like, he was an amazing one. Look at those two jerseys behind you that are sticking out to me. John Smoltz, Kerry Wood, right? Yeah. Amazing starters. And guess what? They also were amazing closers too, you know, but when, when people know Smoltz, you know, I still think of him as a starter. Would I think of him as both, you know, but uh, for it's the same thing. Like I told you, Steve Carsey, starter, closer, Oakland, New York. Everybody, everyone on us has our image of the person based on where we most relate to them. Yeah, absolutely. And you think about it is uh, they had Tommy John as well. Like injuries kind of shifted their careers a little bit to the bullpen and uh, you know, and they've had success there or they did have success there going there because it becomes a mindset at that particular time is, you know, your mind's pretty powerful. And once you start believing in, in your mind that you can do something, uh, there's not much that, that can stop you. And then, uh, you know, obviously Smoltz uh, transition back into being a starter again. And, uh, you know, it was something that he knew how to do and he wanted to do. And he was afforded the opportunity at the end of his career to do that. So he was, he was very good and excelled at, uh, at both roles. Another guy that, uh, you know, Detroit had to trade because uh, for their playoff run, right? Uh, Doyle Alexander. And imagine, John, and John Smoltz was a Detroit boy growing up. And imagine if John Smoltz had stayed on Detroit. But you, you, trade, you trade the prospect to get that veteran to put you over the hump. And, uh, you know, maybe you and Smoltz you have a little more in common than we realize. That's why his jersey's back there. Yeah, absolutely. You know, uh, sometimes uh, trades work out for teams and, and sometimes they don't. Uh, but that's the nature of the business and the nature of the beast. Don't imagine uh, John Smoltz and Doyle Alexander probably had a lot of beers together after that trade, but you never know. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I will give you, I, I will be nice. And I will, when we go to pause now, as we're going to go into chapter eight, uh, I think we need to dig onto this closer aspect because we've hit upon it a couple of times. So we don't want to spoil it. But I, you know, I told you in our generation growing up, you know, what do you call a country singer, a failed rock star? And what do you call a closer, a failed starter? That's what the mentality for many, many years. And I, I want to talk about that in the next chapter as far as you, you growing into the ranks of closer and how that works versus today's game as a coach, hater, and what it, how people from colleges, how they're groomed in the minors, I think the closing aspect is very interesting where it's gone, where it's progressed, where it's going. I know you have a lot of thoughts as far as measuring statistics on relievers. So I think a little sneak preview of where chapter, uh, chapter eight is going to go. We're going to talk about closers. Yeah, no, that'd be great. I mean, I think, uh, as you said, you know, a lot of relievers are failed starters, uh, but most of the guys that get drafted that they want to be, uh, within the organization are starters because you can get more work in. As a starter, you pitch more innings. You can throw more pitches. You have bullpen side days uh, in between. And that's where you that's where you improve. That's where you get better. That's where you do most of your work. So uh, not everybody's going to be a starter. I mean, that's just uh, the nuts and bolts of it. And that's just the way it is. But uh, the ones who excel there and stay healthy end up being starters. Uh, and the ones that don't and have really good stuff uh, – you know, get transferred into the bullpen. And you just see a lot of those guys having a lot of success because one, uh, their velocity usually jumps up and they probably have a pretty good secondary pitch, whether it be a really good breaking ball, change up or slider to, uh, to complement the fastball and the velocity that they have. 
And one guy I think we should talk about because you've mentioned him before is Otani, Shohei Otani. I've talked about him in previous episodes of The Chosen Life and, you know, where he's going. And I've thrown out the argument that he should be actually maybe groomed long term as a closer, might be easier on his arm with the hitting that he's doing. But we, we can definitely talk about that and in the closing, uh, how closers work, the closer role. And we'll debate that in the next chapter. Absolutely. I'd love to. And I would tell the fans watching, please hit that subscribe button. It's very important to find future episodes of The Chosen Journey with Big Money Grip Steve Carsey. And please throw in all your comments. We love the fan interaction. We're still getting interactions on TikTok to this day. People commenting on how great of a dad you are and the sacrifices you're making. And so it's, people are still watching and people are still hitting. So it's really cool to see that. And because uh, we don't just talk about baseball life, we talk about life in general. Absolutely. And it's greatly appreciated uh, on, the, on the TikTok version of it, uh, you know, uh, of being a great dad and, and sacrifices. But I don't look at it as a, as a sacrifice. Uh, I look at it as a, as a, as a, as a duty as a parent, uh, if you're able to be able to be there for your children uh, and your family uh, to uh, have the opportunity to be home a little bit more. And uh, it's just a lot of fun and I'm enjoying it. Uh, do I miss baseball? Of course I miss baseball. I miss certain aspects of the game of coaching and, and the camaraderie with the players and the relationships as we've talked about that I've developed with these guys. You're always going to miss that. Uh, but uh you know, uh, as tough as the choice as it was, it was the right choice because now I get to do the same things with, with my son as, uh, as, as his life is, is moving forward and, and his schoolwork is going and, you know, him playing baseball and having fun. So, uh, you know, I'd love to dig, dig into a little bit more of that and uh, just really appreciate all the, the positive feedback. I've, we're up to 525,000 people have viewed it and so many people commenting. And we do take those comments seriously. So please leave your comments, uh, whether you've met Steve in the past, any games you watch, you recall, general life questions, baseball questions, throw it out there. We'd love to hear it and we'd love to interact with you. Absolutely. Until next time, Steve-O, uh, we'll keep uh, going on our chosen journey and we'll see you back for chapter eight. Absolutely. Thanks, Jonathan. Good to see you again. And uh, always look, to, uh, look forward to our conversations. Uh, on a week-to-week -week basis. Same here. It'll be new hat, new shirt. Absolutely. Cheers.